Ray Carver was always an omnivorous reader. Ray read everything. Now there were things he liked a lot better than others, and he liked uh, fiction. He liked Hemingway as a craftsman and Hemingway as one who maintained absolute control of the tone in his work and who uh, and who whose writing had no fat in it, if you see what I mean. Hemingway's stories are lean, and Hemingway the writer is a tough-minded writer, but Ray also liked Kafka for the for what might be called Kafka's super realism uh, and intensity. Ray liked that very much. Of course, he liked Chekhov, as, uh, as everyone knows. But he also liked some of the big book novelists, uh, such as Dostoevsky, Tolstoy. He liked Turgenev a whole lot. Ray read and read and read. Uh, he didn't simply spring unread into the business of writing stories. He would read these writers that he loved and think to himself, I can do that. I can do that differently. And uh, then he would just go to work very, very hard. You can't really uh, answer a question like that until maybe 50 years after the writer dies. Uh, we know that, uh, oh, for example, Faulkner uh, was a wonderful short story writer who uh, has a place in the literary history of America. Hemingway as well. Three women writers, uh, Flannery O'Connor, Catherine Ann Porter, and Eudora Welty, are also moving into that same, uh, that same level uh, historically as we look at uh, uh, American literature. Of course, Eudora Welty is still alive. Uh, it's hard to say where Ray will fit in. I think that it's safe to say, though, that if Ray had had his 50s, you see, in, 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 in Dostoevsky's 50s was when he wrote his big works. Uh, if Ray had had his 50s to uh, produce, uh, he would have been a major figure in American literature. Uh, as for now, I think we can say he's very influential. There are short stories writers, there are short story writers all over America who are trying to write with the same uh, depth of imagination, intensity, and concision uh, as Ray Carver was able to write in. Why did he uh, fall into this, this extreme of alcoholism? Of course, nobody can ever answer a question that begins with why. Uh, all we can say is that it did happen. Now, I wouldn't even trust uh, psychologists to try to pinpoint the causes for that effect. Uh, we can say that Ray, in some deep sense, uh, lacked confidence not in himself as a writer exactly, but as himself as a person alive. Uh, we can also say that he loved to enjoy himself maybe a bit too much. I, I mentioned before something about celebration. Ray loved to celebrate and uh, I think uh, George Goebel said uh, uh, about something that happened on a previous night, uh, I didn't overdrink, but I was overserved. And I think that very often Ray was overserved. You don't feel that, that perhaps the, the relationship with his wife uh, and the, the sudden sort of, well, I guess it wasn't sudden, but the leap to fame. Uh, how do you think those played in the fact that he drank so heavily for a while? Well, of course, his wife, Marianne, drank too. And uh, in a household where uh, 
both the man and the wife drink heavily, uh, there's not bound to be much order. There's not uh, going to be a whole lot of tranquility and peace. So everything that was a part of Ray's life contributed, of course, to his, uh, to his situation. I would describe uh, the family situation when both of them were drinking as something that Dostoevsky uh, in, in, in a nightmare uh, might have described. Uh, it was really not very pretty. It was not very nice. And sometimes it exploded in violence. Uh, and it always uh, ended with deep misunderstandings, a deep rift between them. And yet, at the same time, they were so tight together uh, that they couldn't fully escape one another. And this went on for years and years and years. Those were the alcohol times, uh, the bad old times. But it's so interesting, he keeps going back to those times in his writing. I mean, for 10 years when he was living with Tess, Packy, all of his stories were involved with those times. Why? A writer, a writer, what can a writer write out of? Only his biography. And that was uh, Ray's biography for a large number of years in his life. Now you do find him, too, writing about things before that, about boys fishing, catching a fish and having to decide how to divide it, for example, hunting. Uh, so you find those boyhood stories uh, in Ray's uh, collections. But the traumatic uh, drunken times uh, made up a large part of Ray's biography and he did his best to uh, realize those, that life in fiction. Each time he did it, the story transcended the life. But in some way, maybe, and certainly in some stories, he was atoning for the life that he led. Uh, Oh, another way to put it is that he was maybe giving back a little bit uh, to the earth that spawned him. So you think he wrote these stories? Do you think he wrote them out of any sense of, of seeking forgiveness or uh, regret for the way he had lived or anything? That's a very difficult question. Uh, who, is, who can regret the life that gave rise to the work, you see? On the other hand, who cannot uh, ask forgiveness from all those people one has offended by living the life one's led? Now, he certainly, in some ways, asked forgiveness of Marianne by treating her truly, if you like, in the stories. Uh, uh, and I think that uh, in, a, in a story like Errand, where he's writing about Chekhov's death, in a way he is uh, atoning for the life that he's led by having Chekhov drink one last glass of champagne before he dies, and then focusing the narrator, that is, not on the champagne, but on the cork. Intimacy is a piece of fiction, and it is a plea, a prayer for forgiveness. At least that's the way I read that story. Now, did those events actually happen in Ray's life? Uh, the man kneeling before his wife, uh, wanting just to kiss the hem of her dress? I don't know, my guess is not. But things should have happened the way they happened in that story. And in that sense, uh, the story is a, uh, a prayer for forgiveness. What, what part do you sense or feel that Tess had in the actual writing of Raymond Carver's stories? 
Well, I think that Tess uh, and Ray, as I said before, they spoke the same language when it came to uh, when it came to literature, and I think that Tess was able to uh, to point out things, particularly in Ray's poems, uh, that were uh, less than uh, uh, less th less than rightly turned. Let's say a poet, and Tess is a poet, and she's a good poet. Uh, a poet knows things that a prose writer doesn't. Uh, and I think that she was able to uh, put her finger on things that Ray would then go ahead and improve. And she might have suggested alternative lines and so forth to some of Ray's, uh, in some of Ray's poems. Now, of course, Ray wrote a lot of his poems when he was by himself, when he wasn't with Tess. She was teaching in Syracuse and he was back out in Port, uh, Port Angeles wrote a whole book of poems there. Uh, when it comes to fiction, and when, when it comes to, to who actually did the prose in Ray's stories and the lines in Ray's poems, Ray is the one. And if Tess made suggestions, I'm I, I'm, I would be surprised if she didn't uh, look at Ray's solutions to those problems as unique. Uh, I like tests and I like, uh, I want to put things gently. I want to be fair. And she had a huge amount to do with his productive creativity. Oh, there's no doubt about that. No doubt about it. Uh, without Tess, uh, I don't know what would have become of Ray. Uh, she supported him uh, in his uh, conviction that he couldn't drink any alcohol. She supported him that way enormously and she encouraged him daily as he encouraged her as a writer. Uh, writing was their life and they both worked in different parts of their different houses all the time. That was what they lived for and for each other. Well, I, I, I would like to say that uh, uh, Ray was one of the most generous people I've ever met in my life. Uh, people who talk about him talk about his size and his generosity, but it, al it, it always went further than that. Ray was one of those rare people in the world who actually listen and who's... Uh, intelligence as he looks at you, uh, you don't quite see at first uh, because he wore glasses and uh, you had to focus your eyes behind the lenses of his glasses to see uh, that keen intelligence in those eyes and he watched and he listened and uh, it was out of that sort of intelligence that both his wit came and his generosity towards human beings. He was a remarkable man. I'm really glad I, uh, I knew Ray. What about those last days? Did you see him when you knew he was going to die? I drove up to Port Angeles from here. I drove up uh, to Port Angeles to see Ray about five weeks, I guess it was, before he died. I had heard that he was dying. And so I called and said, I'm coming up to see you. And I spent a night uh, with him and Tess. And then I spent two days talking to Ray. And we did what we always had done when we got together. We sat out on his deck and uh, told tall tales, stories of uh, mishaps, uh, uh, strange meetings, uh, the things that are unusual that always happen in a world that's a very real and realistic world. And there was always lots of laughter. Ray was a kind of innocent. He would walk into a situation and then something would happen that would just astonish him. 
some of the more usual things in the world. Uh, a man would, uh, would uh, say something fairly intimate to Ray as if he had known Ray. And Ray would say, imagine that, you see. And in fact, he had that same sort of innocence when I went up to see him. Uh, after I left, he told Tess, imagine that, he drove all that distance. Wow, hell, I would have driven a whole lot farther than that uh, to say goodbye to Ray. What would he do when he listened to you? Would he sit there or would he lean forward or what would he do? Uh, wait just a second. <laughs> And Ray would uh, look at you like this, slightly leaning forward. Uh, and he would watch and listen to everything you said. Uh, he then would say, no kidding, really. And he was really interested in finding out. And those things would come into his stories, I assume. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, in his story, Viewfinder, for example, we have a man who's staying at home, and that story was set in Chef's house right near here. A man staying at home, in trouble with his wife, his wife is gone, and who comes to the door? Uh, a traveling photographer wanting to take pictures of the house, and the man has no hands. He has his camera strapped on uh, so that he can focus it with his stubs of arms, uh, strapped onto his chest. And then the character in the story, of course, is thinking, imagine that. He's got a camera and he hasn't even got any hands. <laughs> These, by the way, are what killed Ray. And you smoked them. Uh, yep. You want to take a puff? <laughs> Stories of Ray Carver. <laughs>